Everyone will get started in just a few moments here. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, 2021 State of Healthcare, The Rise of Virtual Care. I am Ash Needham, your moderator for today's discussion. Before we get started, we want to share our deepest and sincerest thanks to everyone working in healthcare right now, especially people on the front lines battling each day to help patients affected by COVID-19. Thank you all. You have done so much this year. Our hearts are with you and there are not enough words to detail your heroism. We also wanna thank our two incredible and esteemed panelists for joining us today. From Prisma Health, we have Chief Digital Officer, Dr. Nick Patel. And from Validic, we have CEO and co-founder, Drew Schiller. Nick and Drew, thank you for joining us. Great to be here, Ash. Glad to be here, thanks. Thank you. Why don't you guys take just a few minutes to introduce yourselves? Nick, let's start with you. Sure, great. Uh, great to be here. Uh, I'm Nick Patel. I um, work for Prisma Health. I'm the Chief Digital Officer and Vice Chair for Innovation and Clinical Affairs for Department of Medicine. Um, been with the organization for 18 years. We're located here in South Carolina. We're the largest healthcare organization in the state. Uh, span over about 45% of the state and uh, also have two academic affiliations um, and um, have been really excited to work on digital health for the last two years as uh, in my current role, promoting virtual care and improving frictionless access through the organization. Great, Drew, over to you. Excellent, thanks. Yeah, Nick, it's really, really great to be here with you today. And uh, so I'm Drew Schiller. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Validic. Uh, you know, Validic is the leader in connecting personal health data from everything you'd capture and people would capture in their daily lives into the healthcare system to make it relevant and actionable, um, providing a lot of data for virtual care solutions. Uh, in addition to being CEO of Validic, uh, I also am uh, on the board of the eHealth Initiative and I'm the uh, incoming chair of the Consumer Technology Association Health Division Board. So really glad to be here for this conversation. Thank you guys. So today we're gonna to host a little bit of a live Q&A with a moderated panel discussion featuring Nick and Drew. We'll kick things off with a series of questions diving into how COVID-19 has shifted healthcare's adoption, interest, and potential with virtual care and delve into what innovations and technologies are on the horizon for 2021. If you have a question for the panelists, please enter it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We have time set aside at the end to dive into your questions. So with that, let's begin. Let's talk about 2020 and how perspectives in healthcare have shifted. What was the biggest change in thinking or lesson learned for providers this year? Yeah, I shall take that one if you don't mind. Um... You know, I've been extremely proud to see how fast digital health has really taken off since March. Um, we did about 22,000 virtual visits last year. As of today, we've done over 440,000 virtual visits. Uh, we've also had about 170,000 engagements in our automated chatbot. Um, we've had great adoption across the whole continuum um, of our providers, both on the acute side, ambulatory side, uh, physical therapy, uh, care coordination, pharmacist uh, who are engaging with patients virtually. Um, and we've had really great feedback from our patients, more importantly. And um, they appreciate uh, the work that we've done in uh, reaching out to them during a time of need. Um, but a lot of us ask us, can we continue this after COVID is over? Um, this you know, has helped with folks who have transportation issues, is help bring in a larger part of their family as part of the conversation when you're having a conversation with a patient around their healthcare. Uh, so it's, it's been very uh, beneficial. And you know the payers, both the state and federal governmental agencies have stepped up to the plate uh, and really helped support health care systems and more importantly, the patients uh, that uh, are their clients. Uh, so I think that it's been uh, extraordinary. I mean, uh, we, 
when we draw out our digital health strategy, a three-year, five-year strategy is really turning into a three to five week strategy. And uh, never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that um, we would have done this many visits in a year. And it's not even the end of a year yet. Yeah, that's, that, that uh, is really just amazing to hear. And, you know, it's, it's something that I've certainly heard uh, uh, echoed from uh, a lot of the folks I've talked with in the industry as well. Um, there's initially, um, there was this overall sentiment of we, we have to go digital right now or virtual right now. I mean, this is happening. It's now, right? And so there's this huge surge of, of video visits. Um, but really, uh, that I think led to two things. One is the realization of, oh, we can go virtual. And in fact, many uh, physicians and other care providers who I've spoken with actually prefer it. Uh, my wife, for example, is a clinical psychologist uh, at a health system. And uh, she actually has been continued to do uh, virtual uh, patient visits throughout this entire, um, throughout the entire pandemic. And, and in a lot of ways, uh, she, she prefers uh, the virtual as opposed to, to, the, to the in-person. I'm sure there will be some mix going forward, but um, I think a lot of folks realize like, oh, we can do this. It's more convenient. It's actually a better patient experience. Um, I actually, I'll tell you a really funny story about this, about uh, about six or seven years ago, I was um, in a meeting with a room full of cardiologists and they were talking about putting a virtual care program in place, uh, primarily starting with video visits. And there was this one gentleman, he was nearing the end of his career. I think he was, he was definitely the, um, the senior in the room. Um, and, and he said, well, we try video visits in my, at my clinic for the, for the rural folks in, uh, I believe he was, he was seeing patients in Nebraska. And he's like, it, it didn't work. And so I said, well, can you tell me more about what happened? He said, yeah. So we set up uh, the, 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 tel the television, the camera and all that in, in, in the office. And so the patient would come into the office and they would sit in, front of the, the, sit in front of the camera with the display. And then I would be at home in my office and I would, and I would uh, you know, call in and we'd have just as few people show up. And <laughs> I was like, you're missing the point here. <laughs> like, it's not for a <laughs> it's, not, it's not for your convenience. It's actually for the patient's convenience. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I think that, um, but I do think that there's, um, there's just so much that we've learned uh, as an industry of that we can stand up this technology, that it can be additive and beneficial, um, and that we can, we can have it going now. And the one overall sentiment other than outside of, oh, wow, we can do this, that I've really heard a lot is, I wish we had this in place before the pandemic hit. Uh, because we had to, so many things had to be cobbled together so quickly in such a short amount of time to, for, for what you're saying. None of this technology was new, right? It was all technology that we've been looking at for, and discussing for years. Um, it's just that, you know, it had, had, there were pilots in place that either started or didn't, or didn't even get to pilot yet. And it's just kind of really just sort of going through very slow iterations because uh, it can feel daunting to operationalize. But I think the pandemic really showed that when um, when there's a will, like we can actually operationalize these things pretty quickly. Yeah, and it was interesting because if you look at what we were using virtual health for is what more direct to consumer, you know, out of pocket, full expense, you know, it wasn't payers were not paying for it uh, for, for the most part. I mean, there's still rural health initiatives and they were paying for some of that. But when it came to truly virtualizing primary care, it just wasn't there. Uh, to the way we wanted it. You, yeah, you can go and pay $29.99, go see a doc uh, virtually, uh, but you may not get your primary care doc, you'll get somebody who's available. Um, and obviously we'll be using it on the acute side for stroke care, ICU, things of that nature. But again, even that side of the fence has exploded because when we're trying to see patients, you know, we're, we have a larger volume of patients who have COVID, that's where digital health really helps and, and also helped on the patient side and the acute side with the patient family connection. So as you know, when we didn't have when in the early stages of COVID and even now as it surges again, we're not allowing family to come back as much. And you, you're in the hospital, you're scared, you're there for something and you have no, no loved ones sitting at your bedside. So at least a, a, an ability to see those people, uh, your family uh, virtually helped a lot of patients. Yeah, that's so great to hear. Great, uh, Dr. Patel, Drew, thank you. You know, now that we're in sort of the last month of 2020 and 2021 is somehow just 29 days away, 
As you look to the future state, how do you see healthcare organizations really shifting their virtual care strategies and response to this year? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in here. You know, I think that uh, one of the biggest things that we've seen is um, a talk of just accelerating the timeline for implementing virtual care um, and building off a lot of these easy wins or, or quick wins, I should say, with the pandemic. They weren't easy, but they were quick. <laughs> and um, you know, we're starting to see a lot of innovative thinking, which I hope, uh, Nick, I hope you'll get into some of the ways you're thinking about things at Prisma, because I, I think it really is, uh, really is going to be a model um, for folks in the industry. But um, just more in general, I think what we're seeing is a lot of innovative thinking around how these virtual technologies can um, actually add efficiency and really benefit um, not only the patients, but also the, the care providers and make everyone um, have just a much better experience. And, you know, one of the things that I've always been very frustrated with um, the state of technology in healthcare is that technology for healthcare workers was always or often seen as something that was going to increase uh, burden on physicians and, uh, and be something that was potentially difficult for patients to use. And as a, as a technologist, you you know, more broad scope outside of healthcare as a technologist, technology is actually supposed to do the exact opposite, right? It's supposed to make our lives easier. It's supposed to augment things. It's supposed to streamline things. You know, if you think about if, if the iPhone uh, made our lives worse, uh, then we wouldn't be spending $150 billion collectively a year on buying new iPhones, right? <laughs> so um, so there's, uh, there, there's, I think, a, a recognition that this tech, these technologies can actually um, really help us moving forward. And, you know, just as a, a really quick uh, example of that, you know, one of the, the RPM programs that we run in the virtual care group inside of Kaiser Permanente, it's a nationally deployed um, solution. Um, one of the things that we've, that we've seen is that um, not only do patients love the program and, you know, they're still recording readings twice a day after 90 days of being in the program, and there's a really high patient net promoter score, but physicians also love being in the program. They also love having patients in the program. 90% of the physicians say the program saves them time. 90% of the physicians say that um, they feel that they're actually providing better care because of the accurate, timely data that's in their workflow. Um, and so these programs can actually be implemented in a way that, um, that is beneficial for everybody in the ecosystem. Yeah, I totally agree, uh, Drew. You know, when you, I've been practicing medicine, internal medicine for about 17 years uh, as a hospitalist and now in outpatient uh, primary care for the last 11. And it's an interesting thing that you go through training, you go through medical school, you go through residency training, and it's always been this, uh, you know, the only time you see a patient is when they schedule an appointment with you, when you walk into the door, and that's the 15 minutes you have to render care. Um, and it's difficult and patients just don't come in with one problem, they have diabetes, heart failure, many things going on. And there's social issues you have to tackle as well. And that paradigm of how we see patients has not changed in centuries. Uh, I was, I was uh, talking on another webinar that we started talking about virtual health in the late 1800s. In, in, in peer reviewed medical journals, they, they started talking about it. There's articles you could pull up that show that. And uh, I mean, NASA started using RPM in the Mercury space program, right? That's how they measure physiology of how an astronaut is doing in space. Been doing it for a long time. I think what's happened though, COVID has happened, yes, but what is the more important thing that has happened here is that there's a shift in how, what is important in healthcare. The importance of healthcare is health, right? And it's not sick care. And I know you've, a lot of you on the call and, and, and folks on this, have heard that before, but there finally is a reason for truly living that. And that is because we're moving more to a value-based care. It's about keeping you healthy. It's not about let's get paid when we put people in the hospital, all right, or let's do this operation. It's about how do we incentivize you to stay healthy? And in order to do that, right, you're gonna have to do more than just see a person every three months, six months, 12 months right? You're going to have to be able to measure how that person is doing in their own environment, real time, their sugars, their weight, their fitness, their blood pressure, their cognitive strain and stress, right? 
And, and so there's that piece of it. So we have to do better by engaging more. So what I was, I call it more digital engagements, right? That, that digital touch point in between office visits is gonna be key to getting people to go. That's one part. The second part is that healthcare in general's mentality of how we deliver care has changed. Healthcare has always been a, you know, more of a healthcare driven, meaning organizational driven, not patient driven, right? Now it's patient focused and patient driven. What I mean by that is that people want a more retail experience. They're customers. We treat them not as patients, but as consumers. And you have to give folks choice because they can get care anywhere. And now they can get care anywhere online. So organizations have to start thinking about how am I going to focus on consumerism to improve access? How do I improve uh, the ability to give these sort of uh, opportunities for these digital assets to be used for remote patient monitoring or automation or um, secure texting? All of those types of things are important to get to that retail experience. And we have to for many other reasons, but you know, I mean, there's been a population shift as well. Right, millennials outnumber a baby boomer population, right? And they have grown up in a total on-demand world. I wanna watch a movie when I wanna watch it and I wanna see it now. I wanna see it on my mobile phone. I wanna see it on my home theater or if I wanna see it on my screen. It doesn't matter, I can do it whenever I want to do it. And, and it's a different shift. You know, when we look at our numbers for the, the, the virtual visits we've done, most of the ones that have happened that uh, had flip phones and um, was audio only, those folks were Medicare, Medicaid patients. So you have to start thinking about a different way of handling that because those are your at-risk patients, not only for COVID, but for everything else, right? So how do I engage them? So it, it needs, you start to think about a little bit more about the social determinants of health, of tech literacy and access to broadband and access to smart devices, right? So those are important things. Um, and, and I'm not really worried about the 21, 21 year old healthy guy that he wants a year for physical. I'm worried about that 80 year old or 70 year old, 65 year old who has chronic disease that I need to monitor so they don't get in the hospital. So it starts that you have to start to change fundamentally the way you think about delivery of care. Um, and I think healthcare systems are doing that. There's a focus of moving out of the hospital to growing ambulatory practices. Now we have 330 and we're gonna continue to grow ambulatory footprint. But when you think about ambulatory footprint, do we need to always build something new? If I can actually have people see you from home and have my provider see you at home, or I have a hub where you can come and see someone 24 seven virtually, and I have all the digital tools in front of you to do an exam. So again, all those things you have to take in consideration when you start to map out your future strategy. Yeah, I think that's such a, such a, a great point, Nick. And you know, it reminds me of um, the, you know, the Blockbuster Netflix uh, situation, right, where um, Blockbuster was so staid in their ways and said, you know, this online thing, it, it's going to be a thing, a little bit of a thing, but I, you really need to go in mm -hmm. to do a Blockbuster every week in order to actually touch and feel your DVDs, right? <laughs> totally missing the entire, like, fact that streaming was going to be the thing. Um, so how, how do health systems, you know, how do health systems um, become more like Netflix in the new model and less like <laughs> avoid the avoid the blockbuster scenario? That's right. Because yeah, if you don't, you will be the only blockbuster left open. Or actually, maybe that one's closed now. I don't know. I think there was one. Yeah, I've been there was one left. Right? Yeah. I think there's not <laughs> one left. Yes, absolutely. Thank you guys. And I think you alluded to this in, in some of the topics about how we're evolving into virtual care, but help us understand why now is the time for remote patient monitoring specifically and how it fits into these larger strategies for virtual care. Yeah, I think RPM is extremely important. You know, video visits are, are good. I'm like, this could be a, you could be my patient right now, Ash, and I could be talking to you about chronic disease or just how you're doing. But if I had your physiological data, if I knew your blood pressure, if I knew your temperature, if I can actually even remotely physically do an exam, listen to your heart and lungs and do all those things, that adds so much more value to that exam, right? So it's more moving out of that glorified Zoom call to really a true healthcare uh, 
uh, visit. So if you try to truly virtualize primary care, for example, those are data thing, the sets that I need. I need to know uh, how you've been doing. I can get that verbally. I can see how you're doing. You look good. You don't look sick. I can, you know, I can maybe pivot a camera to look at a, 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 a skin lesion or something like that. But, you know, I can't do that if I don't have the right tools. And um, remote patient monitoring is beyond just a one-to-one -one visit. I, I want to know how you do when I'm not seeing you. You know, are you doing that fitness that you need to do? Are you doing that, hitting that 10,000 step goal? Are you, is your blood pressure where I want it to be? Is your sugars where I want it to be? If you're a congestive heart failure patient, has your weight shifted so fast that I know your fluid has shifted and I want to give you extra diuretics so you don't end up in a hospital for congestive heart failure exacerbation? Those type of things that are based on data sets that come into the EHR based on thresholds that get escalated are extremely important. Those are the digital touch points I alluded to earlier that I can see and ping and see how you're doing even when you don't know that I'm actually just checking up on you. Um, and that the data is, is helping us drive that better care. So if I see your blood pressure is going up, I can intervene before your six month fall. Why should I have you have high blood pressure for six months or high sugar for six months, right? I could treat you more, much more quickly and uh, get you to your outcome and your goal faster. So, uh, and you know, you know, again, value-based care. Uh, these are goals, hypertension goals, A1Cs goals, preventative goals. Those are all parts of that. So the better those metrics are, the better the healthcare system does from bottom line and dollars, right? Um, and, and so, again, driving to outcome and not just saying, oh, every time I see a person, cha-ching, that's not how it works. It has to happen in between those visits. And it also brings the patients into the fold. Uh, I can't tell you how many pay times I have patients who are engaged that bring in everything from torn notebook paper to post it pads to some people who bring a nice Excel spreadsheet of their blood pressure readings or sugar readings, time and stamp, all that. Guess what happens to that data? I scan it into the EHR. It goes nowhere. It goes into a document stack. Uh, I don't get to take that data out. So if I have more data, right on a person, then I can even drive better care through automation, through the use of AI and some other things I'm sure we'll talk about. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so great. Uh, you know, I, th I think that you really hit on a key point uh, that I was gonna drive home, which is, you know, doctors need data. And, um, you know, just to kind of take that from, a, from another angle, one of the, the very common things that I heard uh, in, you know, kind of the May, June timeframe, once folks really started to kind of catch their breath um, from the initial COVID surges was, uh, was uh, folks in the healthcare system saying, you know, the video visits have been great. And wow, I never expected that I could have almost a full, you know, patient load just from my house and that the patients would enjoy it. But I am now missing <laughs> a critical piece of the puzzle, which is every time I see my patients, they've already, you know, checked in, weighed themselves, taken their blood pressure, done all this other work, and I don't have any of those data now. And those really, it's really important for me to understand what's happening. And I think to your point, even better to have that longitudinal view. Uh, and certainly that's what we've, what we've found with, um, with our clients who are running these longitudinal RPM solutions. Another thing I'll say is that, you know, RPM, you know, there's oftentimes, um, there's kind of the big three, right? There's, there's diabetes, there's heart failure, there's, um, and there's uh, uh, hypertension. But what we're starting to see is that there's a lot of interest in RPM in, in other areas and they can be for acute situations, right? So, I mean, COVID I think is a really great example. Um, when COVID first started bubbling up, this was in February before lockdowns or anything. I remember being asked, we, nobody knew much about the disease. And so I remember being asked, you know, what can tech do to help with COVID? And my, honestly, my initial response at the time, I said, get Zoom. Like that was like my initial, like that's the best thing we could do right now. Cause all I know is that we can't be in person. But once we started to see the symptoms, you know, it became clear that actually data can really help uh, monitor patient or monitor patients who have been either exposed to COVID or who've been diagnosed with COVID um, and monitor them remotely and bring them in before exacerbation. So for example, we're working with 
uh, a health system in the DC area, they've had now, I think uh, around 4,000 patients that they've enrolled in this COVID monitoring solution that we helped them stand up. Um, and they, you know, it's the patients are just taking their, their temperature and their pulse ox and answering a couple of questions twice a day. Very, very simple, um, but dozens upon dozens of patients have been, uh, have been proactively triaged, like brought it, like called on the phone, just checked up, check up on them based on the numbers, brought in, say, hey, come into urgent care, get some oxygen now, so that the, the, the situation doesn't get exacerbated and become much worse. Um, and, you know, we, we feel so proud of that program, and it's really helped reduce the burden for that health system, uh, for their, you know, their, helped them uh, maintain the burden of their, um, their, or the, not be overloaded in their ICUs. Um, it helped them, uh, you know, prevent them from having to intubate patients. I mean, it really did um, have some remarkable things. And, and so that was a situation where, you know, that was RPM on the fly uh, to handle some really critical acute things. But anytime that there's data that can be tracked uh, and alerted on, that's really going to be key for, or really going to be good, uh, a good candidate for an RPM program. Yeah, just to really quickly add to that, Drew, is that, you um... If you're going to truly get to the mecca of population health management, you got to have, you got to have data, and then that's the one you start to be able to treat populations and communities together, uh, uh, and set up uh, help groups for hypertension or diabetes, things of that nature. Those are the type of things will get us to hospital at home, be able to get that data, and being say, yeah, you need a little oxygen. If you only need two liters. It looks like you're at about 88 percent. I'll just send uh, someone to bring you an O2 tank. And we'll monitor from there and see how you do. Well, by the way, I'll check. Let me listen to your lungs real quick while I'm doing that. So those those are the type of things that are going to get us there. And and to really take RPM is then all the support structures you need around it. You need automation. You need data. You need uh, AI to be able to escalate to the right per person at the right time. You know, this is the move towards command centers and access centers around bringing in that data to be able to react to data as it comes in. Because you know, with all this data, there's also a signal to noise ratio. There's a lot of data that may not matter. You have to be under understand when is the data important, when is the data not important. Absolutely. Great points. You know, in, in terms of data and technology, what do you see from 2021 in terms of the technology innovation or the operational improvements that are still needed for this mass utilization, adoption, and really scale of virtual care programs across the enterprise? Yeah, um, so I will say that, uh, I don't know if this is controversial or not, but I don't think we actually need any new technology <laughs> to do this. Um, I mean, all of the technology I said it earlier, all of the technology that we're talking about right now and that we've implemented has been around for years. We've been talking about it and piloting it and getting demonstrations of it, of it um, for a long time. I mean, the data that are needed for things like what uh, uh, Nick is saying around, you know, adding data to population health, it's glucose, it's blood pressure, it's weight, it's data that we've had for, you know, at this point, a couple decades, if not more in some cases. And so we don't actually need um, new technology. Um, what we do need is, uh, I, I believe, um, is a new focus on how we can operationalize this uh, across healthcare, um, because the way that healthcare has operated is going to need to shift in order to fully support these programs. Um, in the same way that, um, you know, in the same way that if you uh, you know, if you try to, if you, what is the, the saying, um, if you do the same thing over and over again, you expect a different result, like that's the definition of insanity, right? And I feel like that's, we've been trying to, to shoehorn virtual care into a, an in-person, you know, sort of uh, episodic care model. And the two are just diametrically opposed. And so I think that there is a way, a model that can support both, but it does require um, some operational creativity. Um, and Nick, I know you have specific thoughts just from having conversation with you on this. I'd love to, to, to get you to, to weigh in here. But um, I think that the biggest shift that we need to make is the mental shift um, as organizations in terms of how are we going to prioritize virtual. I mean, even, for example, our company, we're talking about, you know, what kind of office environment do we have going forward after, after the pandemic, right? Because we have an office that no one's using right now. And, um, and you know, the, the, the answer for us is it's going to be a virtual first culture. We will still have an office. You can still have in-person meetings. And every meeting room is going to have 
a video camera and a TV. And so if you're remote, you can still be a part of that meeting, but virtually um, with everyone else. And so I think that that's the kind of thinking that we need to be doing as, uh, as a healthcare system to really support, um, to support these programs in scale. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Drew, about technologies. The, the technology is there. Uh, it's been there for a while, but it continues to improve. And the biggest improvement that I'd like to see, and I, you know, this again, that your company has done it really well, is the integration into the ecosystem, right? You're building all this different, you have video, you have RPM, you have automation, you have different types of wearables, both consumer, over-the-counter versus those that are kitted and FDA approved and sent to you. And you have to be able to think about how does that data flow into a singular string of flow of data for a patient. So no matter if they come through a digital foot front door or an ambulatory front door or a hospital front door, how does it all kind of connect? And, and then that's the biggest thing I think that companies need to be working on a digital space is the integration with one another. Uh, what is what is that API? What is that? Is it integrated as an in, into the app orchard, smart on fire, all those all those acronyms that get us into the EHR as a source of truth, um, because workflow is extremely important. Because if you know, we've learned a lot of lessons since the High Tech Act, since EHRs over the last twelve plus years, of uh, workflows can be very, very disruptive, right? Uh, average uh, inefic the inefficiency goes up about thirty to thirty three percent when you deploy a new EHR, right? Well, we don't have that luxury anymore. We can't do that anymore. And we sure to heck we can't do that for the patients because if we are down 30 percent then that means that person has difficulty getting into a practice and so integration seamlessness of data flow having a, a really important data strategy is very important as part of your operationalizing this too um, ehr data crm data uh, digital health data wearable data how does that all go into your data lake and how does that get surfaced uh, within the EHR, but also for your marketing folks or your campaigns or your care coordinators or your farm Ds, the whole soup to nuts, right? Because there's data in all of that that matter. Um, and uh, if there's care gaps, and we, we have this chatbot that does the care gaps. So if I know my population of 1.6 million patients, then uh, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I know my data is telling me this swath of uh, patients has not had a mammogram. And I send an SMS or an email and, hey, hey, here's information and education about breast cancer awareness or colon cancer awareness. And uh, would you like to schedule an appointment? It should be a click and forget. Uh, and that's a lot of stuff in healthcare needs to move to more protocol based things, such as, you know, closing care gaps or getting that diabetic eye exam that needs to be done. And, and that's where that data needs to work, where you have to have seamless flow from all the different assets that you have. And, and that's the key part of what we've been doing here at Prisma is to bring all the pieces together, right? How does it work from the ambulatory side, acute side to an automated chatbot to our Salesforce backend or Validic or Conversa as our chatbot? How does that get escalated through a secure texting through our perfect serve application that we have? So all of that really matters. Um, and it also helps you scale. So if you know that, you know, wow, this hospital's down here is getting really killed right now. We need to scale up and folks to come in, or we need to text more people to help out. Those are all important things that um, need to happen behind the scenes. So again, I guess the biggest thing I would say is to adoption is integration is very important and a seamless workflow. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, um, one of the things that, that you said that I really want to highlight is, you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, patient experience and, you know, what, how, what, what does that look like? Um, but we so rarely talk about clinician experience and how, how are physicians and nurses and other, uh, you know, other staff members actually able to use this technology. And so often it's implemented in a way where that's an afterthought. And so it becomes more of a burden. Um, and it's something that, you know, we at Politics spend a lot of time thinking about is how do we actually implement this technology in a way that's helpful, that makes folks more efficient, that, um, you know, we think you, you mentioned integration, which is, you know, 100% core to what we do. That is, that's the reason we are here is because we integrate all of these things. Um, but we also have in, been increasingly talking um, about orchestration. So how do we actually not only integrate these data, but actually orchestrate 
you know, what are the workflows that need to happen because of the data, right? So how can we, uh, based on data, kick off a workflow that maybe triggers a chat or maybe triggers a video visit or maybe triggers a particular escalation, right? What are the things that we can do so that it's not every single thing has to be a decision by a person, but there can be some programmatic decisions based on what the data are coming in. I think that's really, really important. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about just really quick that, you know, you, you and I had a chat uh, the other day about this, and I just would love to, to elevate that here because I think it's so relevant to what we're talking about around um, efficiency in a program is that, you know, I, I had asked you, and this is an, a, a, an honest question, and, and I was fascinated by the answer around, you know, we're already facing a, work, a worker shortage um, uh, in healthcare uh, pre-pandemic. And I've seen just through Twitter and other things around of, of folks who are looking at, you know, kind of maybe retiring early or like just kind of opting out. And, and it, it strikes me that given that the, the healthcare workforce has been running so hard for so long now, for nine months straight, and it's going to keep going uh, for, you know, the foreseeable future, are we going to see even more early retirement? What does that actually do? to the burden on our healthcare system when we already have a, a workforce shortage. I'm just curious of your thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, th this is true. I mean, you, you'd mentioned uh, your wife was a clinical psychologist. We've, we've seen an increase of 130% of mental health services being utilized, both by healthcare providers, but as well as the population. I mean, um, anxiety, depression, suicide rate is extremely high right now. Burnout is very high right now. Burnout was an issue even before COVID in healthcare, right? Resil you know, we have a lot of meetings around the resilience of, uh, in, to bring resilience into healthcare. Um, and, and if you look at the reasons that people burned out, EHR is one of them um, and, and volume is one of them, right? So it comes down to efficiency most of the time. I would say that when it comes to healthcare, you won't hear a patient uh, providers care, uh, complain about, oh, I got this many patients to see today. What they're going to complain, what they're complaining about if they react that way is all the stuff that they have to do to see that patient, all the steps they have to take in the EHR and everything else. But this is why I think digital health is going to help that, right? You, you, and, and I think Drew, you, know, you and I talked about, it takes a minimum 12 years to make a doctor, right? And, it, and, and it's not an easy process. It's not like you just come out and I want 10 more docs, here they are. Um, and every state's credentialing is different. And so I can't just bring people in. They gotta go through a credentialing process, which takes 60 to 90 days at my organization and most others on average. So even from the time you have a problem, you notice a problem, you got three months before you get something in place. And uh, what you have to think about is that most providers, especially let's just use primary care, I'm thinking 1,500 to 2,000 patients most in their panel, right? And the panel has become smaller now because of burnout, because we don't want 3,000 people on your panel. We want you to be able to see 1,500. So now I'm maxed out that provider at 1,500. But the future, I think, is going to be me taking care of 100,000, 50,000 patients with support in the communities and APPs and care coordinators and others where I'm actually helping take care of the patients that have really a lot of chronic disease, but on a larger scale by using RPM, by being data driven and having the right folks empowered to, at their max of their license, take care of folks. Um, you know, you've probably heard the paradigm that 80% of healthcare dollars are spent on 20% of population. That, that is true. And, um, and, and so we need to concentrate on that 20%, but not forget obviously everyone else. And this is where I think digital technology can help. And uh, it's really important that we start thinking that way and not only thinking that way about what we have now, uh, you know, I'm on uh, the uh, School of Medicine faculty and I can tell you that we're already, and a lot of medical schools are thinking about how we're gonna redo our training. Do we really need to do the old two years down, head down, read thousand pages a day and get the academics down and, and get the content down and then third year and fourth year where you do some clinical um, rotations. We're starting it now in the first year. They're starting to see patients early. They're starting to apply what they learn in the book at bedside instead of just read and then go try to deploy. And so I think you have to think about the whole thing. And I think, you know, we're seeing a shift finally for people going into primary care and ambulatory medicine, which is great. 
Um, but it is a challenge. I mean, it was a challenge even before COVID. Um, and um, hopefully we can um, make healthcare fun again uh, by having these type of things available. Uh, so it, I, you know, I can take care of patients more seamlessly and, and have, uh, you know, again, ambient dictation, write my note as I'm talking to you and write the things that I'm thinking down so that I don't have to go document later or click 10 times to do one task. Once we get to that point, I think um, people are not going to get burnt out as much because uh, you have to look at why they're being burnt out. It's usually not because they don't want to care for someone. They love doing that. That's why they went into healthcare. They, you got to get the technology out of the way. And that's the key. Absolutely. Great points. Nick and Drew, thank you guys. We're now gonna move into your questions at this time. So please continue to submit them into the Q&A box. If you have relayed any questions into the chat functionality, we just ask that you move those over into the Q&A button, which is at the bottom right of your menu bar. All right, so the first question is from Wally. What's the virtual care RPM solution in rural communities? Uh, especially as things like broadband access continue to be a challenge. Um, how have those been served by rural hospitals that have closed? Yeah, we, this is a big initiative for Prisma Health. Uh, you know, luckily the, the, the FCC has released a lot of uh, grant funds around this, about $100 million. Um, and, and even the state has matched some of that. And um, uh, as I said earlier, a lot of our patients, our Medicare, Medicaid patients are using audio only. They don't have flip phones. They don't have broadband access. Uh, I grew up in a very small town in, in, in South Carolina, only three traffic lights. And I could tell you, I had to go 40 miles when I was sick to see a provider. Oh, actually, my parents drove me 40 miles to go see a provider. So, uh, you know, it, it, it is a still an issue. I mean, the population of South Carolina is about 5 million patient of uh, 5 million people and 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 we're, we're, we're spread out everywhere and so it is very important to have broadband access into those areas so we're actually looking at some innovative ways to do that working with our colleagues with the universities and other folks uh, with local business um, and actually adding 5g to previous what's called etv or public uh, broadcast towers that used to be used at schools where they used to you know send in data or uh, uh, send in classrooms uh virtually, right? They, they've been doing that since the 80s. But those towers have been just sitting there for the last 30 years. And so now we're thinking about putting uh, LTE and 5G onto those, working with our carriers and local businesses to sponsor that, and then working to get smart devices uh, uh, to, uh, to patients. So now they have access, now they got a tablet, now that I can use all the, uh, the Bluetooth and other devices that I want to put in their home. Um, but there's, there's a huge move for that. And, but there's also needs to be education. Uh, there, we need this, again, social determinants of health, tech literacy, making technology simple to use, one click, easy to do, not click this email, okay, enter your name, do all these other things, just click and go. Uh, and that's an extremely important part of getting out into rural community, but starts with access and, and education. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll add that you know, there are um, a number of devices, it's not dozens, but there are several devices um, that, you know, like weight scales and blood pressure monitors, uh, et cetera, that have cellular chips that can transmit um, those data over 2G and 3G. So, you know, even before we get, I mean, certainly we have to solve the infrastructure challenge. And, and I think that it's a really, um, really interesting to hear about, you know, utilizing those old towers. But even before we solve the infrastructure challenge, like, there are ways to um, deploy um, some of these devices to folks who, um, who don't have access to broadband now, but um, like I said, can still operate on the, the lower bandwidth uh, cell networks. Yeah, just to add really quick to that, and I, I totally agree. I mean, the broadband piece is more of a larger arc that we're looking at because if you look, even think about schools, when a lot of kids got laptops and Chromebooks to go home on, but they didn't have access to broadband at the house. And maybe their parents had a data plan on their cell phone they can hijack for a little bit, but they couldn't do a live video classes on it, right? So we actually have kids that are going back to the school where they set up hotspots at the school and the kids are in the parking lot sitting in their car with their laptops. So we got to do better than that. Um, we can't just rely on cell phones. Cell phones are important. A lot of people have them, that's great, but not everyone's on unlimited plan either. 
Um, and so when you start to think about all the users of that cell phone, if they're going to use it as a, as a mobile hotspot for laptops and virtual classes and RPM data, and video visits, the data builds up quick. Even though there's great compression technology and, and all of that, it, it does it, it does go away pretty quickly. I don't know if anyone's ever clicked on their monthly utilization of data on their cell phone. I'm on an unlimited plan, but I mean, I was like, wow, I did 10 gigs. I mean, that's crazy. You don't even think about it, how many things that are happening on your cell phone in the background or those apps are feeding data into it. So I think cell phones are very important. I think that's a great thing to have, obviously, for video visits and all that. Uh, but we got to think about access. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, with Elon Musk Starlink program, allowing for uh, micro satellites and suborbit to send out Wi-Fi signal to everyone on the planet is going to help with that. 100%. Completely agree. So we've gotten a couple questions about the idea of patient engagement and even their interest in being involved in these type of RPM programs where their data is being monitored and used within care management. You know, how are patients willing to uh, use the devices? How are they willing to um, donate their data to these programs all in the names of uh, approving outcomes? Yeah. Um I'll, I'll jump in with a really quick story. I mean, pa patients in our experience um, really want these programs and love these programs for the most part. Um, and, uh, you know, just as a, I shared an example earlier where, uh, you know, one of the, the programs that we run, which is the largest remote monitoring program in the country, um, you know, after three months in the program, patients are still taking their readings at least twice a day. 75% of the patients are still taking readings at least twice a day. So very high engagement. Um, on an N of one scale, you know, we had a, a gentleman um, participate in one of our early programs uh, back in 2016, and he had he had uh, he has type two diabetes, and he had gone through um, uh, you know years of working with his endocrinologist to try to get his type one or type two diabetes under control, and really struggled with it, and for over a decade is just uncontrolled, and is. His A1C was was just um, not something he's able to control. He was really just unhealthy, um, and it wasn't for lack of trying, right? He was doing what Nick was saying. He would bring the data in <laughs> to his to his doctor and saying, "Can you help? Here's here's my glucose levels. Can you help me?" And the doctor is like, "I don't know. I don't have any way of doing anything with this." But your A1C is telling me you're not doing the right thing. And so so this person, his name's Steve, actually got enrolled in a program that we were running where the data from his glucose monitor as well as a blood pressure monitor and a weight scale uh, and activity tracker went into the clinical workflow. And within, so he, he said, if you want an engaged patient, day one, I was an engaged patient because I, that's all I wanted was for my data to go somewhere <laughs> and like know that the doctors could see it. Um, but what happened was a few weeks into the program, he had a call with one of the clinicians involved in the program who recognized there was something that he was, that his glucose levels were spiking at a certain time at night. They talked about what was happening. It turns out he's eating popcorn. He thought that that was a healthy thing and it wasn't, and it was not healthy for him. Um, and so he cut out the popcorn within 30 days, his A1C dropped by half a point. And it was the first time he'd ever seen like, oh, I can actually do something that, you know, because the doctor saw my data, we had a conversation about the data. I can now make a change that impacts my health. And then from then on, he's hooked. And now you know, here we are four years later or so, and he's, you know, lost 50 pounds, his A1C is under control, he's healthy, he's active, he's swimming every day, he's organic gardening. I mean, he's, he's a, a, a new, a new person. Um, and it's really because, you know, the very simple thing with the data he's already capturing just got into the workflow where his physicians and him could have a real conversation around it. Um, so I, I think patients do want to be engaged and they're just frustrated that it's so hard. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I, I think the, you know, one of the things maybe as root of that question is security. Uh, you know, I think Drew, you guys know how, how, you know, this infosec that you went through with us, how grueling that can be. I think uh, data is, you know, it is important. I mean, this is healthcare data. And so we have to have front end, back end systems for monitoring that security. We have to have consents of the patient to allow for that, which is part of the process, right? They click in into EULA and they say, yeah, I want this data to go to Dr. Patel. And so that is, um, that's foundational, I think. Um, but then you could start to think about, you know, what, what some of the stuff that we're trying to do statewide is 
non-scrub data, I mean, uh, de uh, de-identified data, right? So if we wanted to start to look at state of South Carolina and my health system and other health systems started to give into a pool of data to see where the hotspots are as a heat map, that without any information, without any sort of uh, identifier of the patient is also very helpful because it under helps us understand where do we need to build ambulatory practice? Where do we need a hospital? Where do we need to put more community uh, support and help out there, right? So I, I think that so long as you have consent of the patient and understanding what the data is gonna be used for, and, and don't forget, you'll still have a rapport with a patient, uh, with a doctor. It's not like you're just sending this data into a void somewhere. You're not sending it to Validic, you're sending it to Prisma. Uh, you're sending it to our providers. So uh, that's, that's extremely important piece. And part of the education that goes uh, into enrolling into a patient into the program. But I, I can promise you, just like the example that Drew gave, patients who want to be better with their health are going to be engaged. And they want these kind of tools to, to help them get to their goals. Completely agree. Thank you both. So we've gotten a few questions centered around legislation, regulation changes, even changes expected from the administration change. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you see on the regulatory horizon, uh, anything with reimbursement or just returns that support wide scale RPM and virtual care deployments? Well, I, I hope and pray that we don't regress back into an infantile state <laughs> of thinking. Uh, is what I'm hoping. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, with the current administration and the new one coming in, I think there's going to be continued support for this because they've seen what has happened in the last nine months uh, with the utilization of digital health. And um, I mean, even Seema Verma said the cat's out of bag, you know, um, that this is uh, the genie's out of the bottle. I think this is the actual statement she said. But um, I think everybody's starting to see this. And, and even the payers are seeing, it's like, wow, we're not seeing as many people coming in. They're in the hospital. They're not going in uh, to the ER as much. Now, part of that, of course, is people not going there because of COVID. But part of it is that people don't want to go there because uh, it's better to get care in the ambulatory setting where, with their own provider versus some person you don't know. And now that we have these tools in place, I can easily click a button and see a person get, get scheduled. And uh, so I, I think that uh, the policies and regulations are gonna continue. And I can tell you that every single healthcare system, including ours, because I help write some of this stuff for our organization, is putting policies together, working with our lobbyists, working with our local and state agencies around pushing that this doesn't go away. Now, will it be exactly the way it is now? Probably not, but even, I, I think if it is, resembles 95% of what it is now, I think everybody would still be happy. I think patients should be allowed to use their health insurance for digital health, period. I shouldn't have to pay out of pocket just because I, I want to see a doctor virtually uh, fully and not get covered as an ambulatory visit. It should be covered. At the end of the day, you're trying to get care. And um, I, I think cooler heads will prevail. Um, I think uh, now that COVID is hopefully, I don't know it's peaking right now, but as the vaccine comes out and more antibody treatment, uh, outpatient treatment comes out, I think that we'll start to see um, some of the dust settle from COVID, but I think the benefit out of all of this, and I've said this before, is that hopefully with everything that's happened and uh, you know with COVID, that we'll still end up with a truly modern day healthcare system. And I think that that's where a government and your state agencies are going to help. So this is very important for anyone listening from large healthcare systems or even small community ones, go out there and make sure you talk to your local state and federal government. Don't let them take this away from us because this is gonna be very important for true, uh, to render care in the future. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with, with that. And not to, I, I wanna pile on. So I'll just say that I, I do know that the uh, 2021 physician fee schedule was actually um, released just yesterday, which happened to clarify some parts of um, the RPM codes, which is helpful. So we have a little bit more um, guidance there. Uh, and I think that we expect to see a little bit more um, sharpening of corners based on some things that we um, feel are were not quite addressed, but, um, but that's, that's a super, certainly a helpful clarification. Um, and I, yeah, I also agree with you, Nick. I think that a lot of um, what has been extended through the public health emergency are going to ultimately probably be um, turned into legislation at some point, um, you know, over the next year, uh, just because 
um, whether the cat's out of the bag or whether it's because people are receiving better care, it, ultimately what matters is that we are actually seeing utilization of virtual and digital healthcare tools and you know, patients prefer it. It makes the healthcare system more efficient. So I think that I, I do think that the um, the federal government will uh, will step up there. I think that one thing just to add is that I, I I just hope that healthcare systems don't start of thinking of RPM as another revenue stream. That's not why we're doing it. It's it's not that chronic care management code every month that we could get. Yeah, that's great. It helps support the program and all that. But don't start with that. Start with the reason that we all have, right, to improve care. And especially as you look at your large at-risk population and, and shared savings programs that you have, think about the bottom end, uh, end dollars by saving someone, downstream revenue savings that you'll have when you keep people out of hospital. That saves a lot of money for the healthcare system. These are bottom end dollars. These are not you know, and most health systems work on a two to five, three percent margin. So, any any savings is huge for us. Great Absolutely. point. So we've gotten a few questions just talking about the idea of not overwhelming physicians and how do you get them actively participating in these virtual care programs, specifically a few around remote patient monitoring. Um, in terms of the functionality of the technology, one comment was you know, a lot of vendors talk about how they can integrate inside the EHR, but aren't able to make that really efficient. And how do you prevent uh, data overload with things like triggers? Drew and uh, Dr. Patel, can you talk a little bit about how technology can really help prevent data overload and help um, and can truly be integrated into the workflow? Drew, you want to start? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I I've said for years now that, you know, if if you implement this technology and the response from the clinical team is um, that there's a data overload, then you then we've we've done it wrong, <laughs> um, because it should make things more efficient. And I'll give some examples. Um, so the, the the what's important is that the data end up in the clinical workflow, and what's important is that data that are relevant um, that need to be taken that where, where actions need to be taken are escalated in the right way. But it's really important that the uh, administration and the physicians have control over what relevance data is. Because if, if a physician is alerted when someone takes a reading and they didn't care, that's gonna be data overload and it's gonna cause them to just ignore the alerts. But if a physician is alerted based on data that they said, I need to know if uh, this kind of reading comes through from this patient, they're gonna wanna know because that's, that's them providing patient care. And so, so if, it's re if they have signed up for, yes, this is relevant for my patient care, um, then, uh, then that's gonna be something that's not data overload. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So uh, in one of the programs that we have, um, there's a, a, a need for a patients to record a glucose reading uh, at least once per day. And so if a patient doesn't record a, a glucose reading in a 24 hour period, the care team does not need to know, right? But the patient needs to know. So the system alerts the patient and says, hey, don't forget you're in this program. And every 24 hours, if the patient doesn't report a reading, it reminds the patient, hey, don't forget you're in this program. Don't forget to take this reading. Now, if the patient goes for seven consecutive days and they haven't recorded a reading, at that point, this particular uh, health system has said, that at that point, our care team needs to know that the patient's gone a week without recording a reading because we need to then reach out and find out, you know, get a care manager to reach out to them and find out, is their device not working? Are they not feeling well? Do they just not want to be in the program anymore? Like what's going on, right? To, to really better understand. And so they only get that alert when there's, you know, when, when it's something that is actually something that they need to take action on. So that's, that's the bottom line is that make sure that physicians and care team members are only getting alerts that they have signed up for. This is actually something we want to know. Yeah, and just really quickly, I know we're close to time, is that we've actually put together a clinical content advisory council that helps uh, set those thresholds. We don't want individual providers to set separate thresholds. We want it to be system-wide for those hypertension CHF and diabetes programs. And, and so it's very important to have some, some sort of centralized way of governance around that. And that's number one. Number two is this is where it's important to understand what those escalation points are and how do we automate as much as we can uh, through chatbots and so that, hey, if I see your blood pressure going up, I see your last three are going up, hey, have you taken your medications? Did you miss a dose? 
those kind of things are basic things that any nurse will add. So how do we automate some of those basic things and then be able to escalate that based on that input to a care coordinator or an APP if needed? Um, because as we have a larger and larger population, yeah, you're going to get a lot of data coming in at you and, and trying to drink from a fire hose. But that's where it's important to make sure you have the filters in place to understand what's important and what's not. And that's where automation also plays a huge part. Absolutely. That is unfortunately all the time we have with Dick and Drew today. I want to thank you all for attending our 2021 Virtual Care Trends webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers for participating in today's discussion and the insights shared. This webinar has been recorded and we apologize for those who experienced technical issues. You will be emailed a link to the recording in the next 24 hours. Thank you all again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Great. Thank you.